Many people had a problem trying to decide whether Mr. Gorgiev was a good man or a bad man. In fact, Uspensky said that very thing. And in the end, Uspensky decided that the teaching was good, but Mr. Gorgiev was bad. <coughs> now, Mr. Gorgiev was very, very good at displaying his beast. If you've seen the uh, videos on YouTube, there are a few videos of Mr. Gorgiev. Uh, he's there smoking his cigarettes. And in his writings, he quotes many, many times that he likes a drink. He likes his Armagnac, which is a form of uh, brandy. And this is all the beast. And in fact, it was even said that Mr. Gorgiev would seduce and sleep with many of his students. I don't know if that's true or not. But if you want a really good insight into the way Mr. Gorgiev lived, then there's no better book than the book by Fritz Peters which is the recollections of a, a young boy who Mr. Gorgiev seemed to take under his wing and Fritz Peters tells, tells it as it is the intellectual treatment that you get from people like Uspensky and John Bennett and others is really just masturbation it's not the real thing read Fritz Peters if you want to get a taste of the essence of Mr. Gurdjieff. Mr. Gurdjieff was at one with his beast and that's a very very rare thing but he was at one with his beast but he was also beyond his beast even more rare. So let's talk about the beast because you and I are essentially beasts uh, religions and various spiritual movements and so on try to persuade us that we are something else, something divine, something, um, oh I don't know, you know, saintly, potentially, and it's all nonsense. And in fact, if you go down that route, you will end up so fucked up. Uh, and in fact, Osho uh, says in his books that he believed that the saints were all insane. Uh, I d again, I don't know if that's true, I wasn't there, but um, it's interesting that these people say these kind of things. So, Mr. Gorgiev knew his beast. He was not ashamed of his beast. And in fact, there are stories of him going into, um, I think it was some kind of outhouse or something at the Priore, with male members, and they just tell dirty jokes and um, toilet humour, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, a lot of men like that kind of thing. Sorry, ladies, but we do. And... Um, it's just one way of really being at one with our beast. Now, I'm going to show the ox herding pictures. And, well, in fact, they're already on there. And the ox herding pictures are a real education in the nature of the beast and how we get to be at one with it. Now, one of the teachers I had a lady who knew Gurdjieff would use the ox herding pictures to basically go through the process of what is, uh, I guess, some people might call enlightenment. I, yeah, I don't like that word, but certainly a process of becoming one with yourself. Now, I'm going to go through these pictures left to right and go along the, the top row, and then the bottom row. So, the very first picture we see some little character who's sort of looking around there's a waterfall near him the water's fairly turbulent in this in this um, at the bottom of the waterfall and he, he seems to be searching for something and you and I are searching for something and the irony is that the thing we're searching for is the beast we're told that we should be searching for enlightenment or we should be searching for some pure state of being or to be loving and kind and yeah, da da da. Um, what we really need to find is the beast because the beast is what we are. When you find the beast you will come home. When you can be at one with the beast you will be at one with yourself. So first picture he's kind of looking around searching and then we get to the second picture and he's found some you can see just in front of him there's some what look like tracks 
So he's on the center of the beast. Now most people are not even that far. They're not on the center of the beast at all. In fact they're running away from the beast because they're pre pretending to themselves that they are you know, I don't know, enlightened people, new age people, um, on the path, whatever words you want to use. Anyway, this character has decided he's going to search for the beast and he's running in the direction of the tracks. And then we get to the, fir the third picture which shows him just having caught the back end of the beast before it disappears into a bush. Now why is it so hard to find the beast? Well, first of all, our mind does not want to accept that the beast is the boss. We have, as human beings, we have a surfeit of intelligence, excess intelligence. But this intelligence is really sort of kind of weak. The main driver in us is the will to survive, what Schopenhauer called the will to live or the will to life. This is the real hard driver. People can say whatever they want in terms of their spiritual growth, but if they are in a situation where they can get an advantage over somebody else in some kind of way, typically they will do. This is the will to life, the will to live. So there's a reluctance to look at the beast because the beast isn't very flattering. It's a big smelly thing. It shits all over the place. It's got ticks all over it. Its breath smells like dog breath. So this is not a particularly flattering thing. Anyway, he just sees the back end of the beast. It's like someone just seeing for a short period, oh yes, I've got a bit of hatred in me. I, you know, ooh, I don't, uh, I don't always wish people well and so on and so forth. You know, a little bit of honesty creeps in. So he sees the back end of the beast. And then we see him in the next picture having found the beast and he's got a rope on it and he's pulling on the rope but the rope the beast doesn't really want to be seen because it's facing away from us trying to run away and this guy's having a hell of a time trying to hold on to it and the beast doesn't want to be seen because you know it's just not a very pretty thing <laughs> we don't want to look at the beast and then we get to the next picture, which is the last in the first row, the, sorry, the top row. And you can see that he's walking along with the beast. He's reached some kind of resolution with the beast. The rope is loose. There's no tension in that rope. And the beast is sort of just trotting along with him. And then we get to the next picture, the first on the bottom row, where he's sat on, back of, on the back of the beast. Now the beast doesn't look all that placid, and in truth it isn't placid, the beast is the beast. And he's merrily playing his flute and just riding on the back. He's at, he's at one with this smelly big lump of meat that's uh, trotting along and look, looking a little bit aggressive. But he's at one with it. He's been honest enough to say, yes, this is what I am. I am this will to life and this will to life is primarily interested in each individual creature in its own survival it's not interested in anything else so this will to life whenever it gets frustrated whenever things don't turn out the way that it wants you know so if you went up to the bull and whacked it with a stick it would probably go charging off or it probably have a good go at you in actual fact. So, you know, all of a sudden this guy's riding on top of all the manifestations of the beast, which are things like hatred, envy, obsessive pleasure, pride, jealousy, derision, love, fear. Now I use the word love in the sense of pleasure, in the sense of Spinoza's use of the word love because for Spinoza love is synonymous with pleasure. Now in some of the groups that I've been involved with love is sort of like a four-letter word you don't say it and the reason you don't say it is because it's a very very sacred word and for most of us 
Love is effectively pleasure. You know, I love my car. Oh, I love this chocolate cake. Oh, I love this woman or this man. Yeah, because they give us pleasure. Maybe they flatter us. They're very physically attractive. There's some kind of sexual thing going on. Um, but love, in actual fact, is something beyond that. It's something beyond the animal, in actual fact. But, as I say, it's not something to talk about in a podcast because it's a very sacred thing. Anyway, we then get to, to the next picture. And lo and behold, the, the bull has disappeared. Well, he's no longer fighting against it. He's at one with it. So he doesn't see it. You know, he's just manifesting as a true being instead of trying to conjure up in his head some picture of what he should be. He's all of a sudden what he is. And then the next picture, uh, which is basically just a, a circle with nothing in it, shows that the man has transcended both himself and the bull. And then the next picture just shows what, what in Zen they describe as the, the fountain of life. And finally the final picture. He's just back to ordinary life. And this ties in very well with the uh, saying in Zen that first of all mountains are mountains, then mountains are no longer mountains, and then finally mountains are mountains once again. And I've done another podcast where I explain that kind of thing. So these bull herding pictures show very well the nature of the task ahead. Uh, it isn't trying to become a holy or perfect person. It's basically getting in contact with your smelly, uh, temperamental and potentially violent animal, your beast, in these pictures, the bull. Uh, these are called the ox herding pictures. They are classic throughout the Zen um, tradition and they show the process that's involved. So let's talk a little bit about um, our lives. So because we have this excess of intelligence, well some people do, <laughs> um, we are fairly adept at using words as though they mean something. So we might read a book that says that we should practice loving kindness towards people. Well, guess what? The bull doesn't want to practice loving kindness. The bull is interested in eating, shitting, copulating and sleeping. It's not interested in loving kindness at all. You know, if that's going to happen, it's going to happen way after having become one with your bull, with your beast. So, what you find in most spiritual traditions is actually just simple hypocrisy. I've mentioned in other videos that if you try and ignore the beast, it will cause trouble for you. Or if you try and go against the beast, it will cause trouble. Because the beast is 99% of what you are. This 1%, which is your intellectual function, has almost no power. It seems to have a lot of power because it can figure out how gravity works and all that kind of thing. But at a personal level, it has almost no power. The real power is in the beast and the bull. And that is why if you want to get to know yourself, you have to get to know the beast. That is the real you, like it or not. So, the beast is what you are, but actually the beast can be transcended. But not until you're at one with it. Not until you're happy to um, wallow in all the shit and the smells and the... Uh, animal behavior, not until you've seen all that inside yourself can you transcend it. Because if you try because basically you would have no real platform to do that. 
because the real energy in you is the bull. So I put a quote here by Schopenhauer who you know, more than anybody understands all of this and he says the first, the first quote on that particular slide he says, but he will fear least to become nothing in death who has recognized that he is already nothing now and who consequently no longer takes any share in his individual phenomenon because in him knowledge has, as it were, burnt up and consumed the will. So that no will, thus no desire for individual existence, remains in him any more. Now, <laughs> there are two things going on within everyone. One is the beast and the other one is what Gurdjieff and Jesus Christ called the Lamb. Lamb is your finer feelings and aspirations. But the Lamb on its own has no real power. You have to be riding on the back of the beast before you can do anything. So the words in this particular quote here that are important, or the, the bit of it that's important, is where he says, because in him knowledge has, as it were, burnt up and consumed the will. So there's a strange process can take place in man, and this process is that by observing the beast, by being at one with it, you can effectively become indifferent to it, as the little man in the ox herding picture is shown you become indifferent to it. And in fact, you may no longer really be interested in the beast because the beast has actually got some fairly nasty traits that you have to become one with. And this excess intelligence that we talk about can look at that and say, you know, this is not right. This is not right that basically I should... Um, or everybody should strive for their own existence at the ex expense of everybody else. Because this drive for life, this drive for existence is blind. It has no intelligence. And I was told many times in the Gurdjieff work that man is on the leading edge of evolution and that in a sense the whole universe uh, is, how can I put it, has expectations of man to some extent that he can view what is the, the, the blind dynamics and look at it and actually say, no, I don't want any part of this. It's only ever going to lead to suffering. So in effect, what man is doing is adding intelligence to this blind force of will, this blind will to live. And in the uh, bottom quote, Schopenhauer quotes, uh, sorry, the quote from Schopenhauer says, In the hour of death it is decided whether the man returns to the womb of nature or belongs no more to nature at all. Of course, this is what the Buddhists would call uh, stepping off the wheel of life and death, of suffering and pleasure. And in the Christian religion, it's salvation. You know, all the religions have some way of describing this process. But the essence of the whole thing is that, as Schopenhauer says, in him knowledge has, as it were, burnt up and consumed the will. In other words, the intelligence within a man has seen the nature of the will and effectively has rejected it. So such a man, when he dies, will probably have very little interest in life, in truth, in the normal dynamics of life. The dog-eat-dog, dog, um, the one creature consumes another creature, basically the carnival of carnage, as somebody has described it, that is essentially life. So in the hour of death it is decided whether the man returns into the womb of nature or belongs no more to nature at all. But the key to all of this is not running away from the beast. The key of it 
is to become at one with the beast to understand it to see it and that is not an easy process and it's actually quite a dangerous process because as Jung said it's necessary for every man to face his demons and those demons are very very strong you know this big smelly infected um, beast is not a pretty sight and so you need courage and you need um, persistence to do that so love your beast your beast is your route to salvation oddly enough the very thing that seems most despicable within you is actually the very thing that will allow you to become free because I talk many times about self-observation accepting things as they are when you're hating experience the hatred when you're envious experience the envy when you are full of pride experience the pride when you are full of derision experience the derision when you're fearful experience the fear do not try and change it just look at it and do not judge it that is the beast at work and only when you can sit easily with those things have you effectively mounted the back of the beast and can you ride along with it and only then can you in an objective way look at the behavior of the beast and say is this how I want to be and you can say well in, you know in my case it's simply a matter of do I want to be part of a world where you know the whole thing is essentially driven by dog eat dog the strong dominate the weak and the massive suffering that is caused by those dynamics by this blind will to live do not think for a minute that the will to live which is in every living creature every plant and every animal every human being has some kind of intelligence it has no intelligence it's just a blind force in the same way that gravity is a, gr a blind force and it seems that the role of man is to look at this blind force and to either participate in it as you know obviously a lot of people do you know you look at Donald Trump there's a man fully fully driven by the beast he's not I don't think he's even aware of the beast you know he's just unconscious he wants more power he wants more money he probably wants more women he wants you know whatever life can offer and to hell with what that costs for anybody else so there you there we are love your beast it's the first step on the route to some kind of freedom <laughs>